Hi, this is Laura Chappell, and in this training session I'm going to show you how I analyze a bot-infected host using Wireshark. Now first I want to show you the suspicious traffic that made this customer believe that they had a problem on the network. If you look at this trace file, you'll see what was happening on the cabling system. They had a number of devices that were being scanned by this 10.129.211.13. Now let me show you something interesting about this scan. First of all, we see a number of these handshake packets going out to all of these different target addresses here, I mean, all these different systems. Now these are all TCP scans taking place, and we can see the port that they're going out to, which is the NetBIOS port 139. Now it's interesting in this trace file because if we look a little bit further on, we'll see at different points we see these ICMP destination unreachable responses, and we see a number of them grouped together at the end. These are all of these different systems responding to that scanning device. Now, if you know TCP, how it works, when we do a TCP scan on a target system, we send it a SYN packet. We say that we want to synchronize the sequence number, and we point to a specific port number. We expect to get back either a SYNAC or a RESET. We do not expect to get back an ICMP destination unreachable port unreachable message. That may be an indication that that host is firewalled so that it will not respond the way that we expect it to. Remember, with TCP communications, we expect to see that SYNAC or a reset. So we've got these scans going out on the cabling system. Now, the way we can tell that a host is uh, infected with a bot a lot of times is just by passively listening to what that host says when nobody's sitting at the keyboard. So let's go to the top of this trace file. Now here, our infected host, our bot infected host, is this 10.129.211.13. And the first thing that we see is, we see it goes out and it does a DNS query. And it does a DNS query for bbjj.househot.com. What it gets back is a canonical name or an alias response, indicating that the alias is ypgw.wallone.com. Well, if we look at that response, I'll show you a classic sign that there may be a problem on the network. The response that came back, I'm just opening up the DNS portion here, and DNS has these four parts to it. It has questions, answer resource records, authority resource records, and additional resource records. Now most of the time, if you look at your DNS traffic, you'll probably see that in the response, you get the question restated back to you, and you get one or maybe two answer resource records. It's unusual to see 12 resource records, so for me, that's always a trigger that I want to pay attention here to what's going on. So I'm going to open up the Answers section, and if I look down in here, I can see uh, ypgw.wallone.com. There's the alias for bbjj.househot.com. And here are all of the different IP addresses ass assigned to ypgw.wallone.com. Now when I see a lot of addresses here, it always makes me very, very concerned, because really, it's unusual to see that. Most of the time when I see that on a network, this is probably a list of IRC servers. So let's see what the client does when it gets this DNS response. Up here in packet number three, we can see that the client goes out and it does a SYN to port 18067. Now, what runs on port 18067? I want you to think for a moment. What runs on that port? Okay, this is a trick question because the answer is anything. Anything can run on any port. And that's why port filtering devices are very limited because we can go around that by using other ports for our services. So if we look at the response that came back, the very first IP address listed in that response was this 216.234.235.165. And sure enough, that is the first target that our bot infected host went after to try and make a handshake. Now notice that we have a TCP handshake going out and a destination unreachable port unreachable coming back. Now this makes me feel that that target system has got some firewall process or something loaded where it's responding with ICMP instead of a TCP reset or a TCP SYNAC. Our client tries again and it's unsuccessful and it tries again and it's unsuccessful and then our client gives up and now it does a DNS query for ypgw.wallone.com. It's now going after the canonical name. Now at this point, I'll scroll down, and we can see here is the DNS reply that came back. And in this DNS reply, we're looking at the answers section down here. And in the answers section, we can see that it says ypgw.wallone.com, 
and there are a number of different IP addresses associated with that. Again, that makes me nervous when I see this big list that has the feeling to me like this is probably a list of IRC command and control servers because that's very typical to see on a bot infected host when we start doing our DNS queries and getting our responses. So we've got all of these addresses and the very first address in that list is the 61.189.243.240 and sure enough our client goes out and does a handshake to that target system. There's our SYN packet, it's going out again on port 18067 which we know anything can run on that port. In this case the client is successful. We see the SYN ACK come back and the ACK, the three-way handshake, is completed. After that we can see that the client immediately sends data up to that server using the push flag. That's also an unusual flag to see. We would see that on something like a Telnet communications, uh, something where we don't want the data being buffered on the way out or buffered on the way in. We want it to go and be delivered right away. But we don't recognize, and Wireshark doesn't recognize, what is running on port 18067. Now, when you see something like this, you can say that you want to view the packet bytes and you can spend a lot of time looking down here in the packet bytes section and trying to understand what data is going through the packets. So as we look at the client sending data up to that server, we can see it saying user space and then L space L space L space L. We can see this going up, user space L L L L, going up to the server. We see the act coming back, then we see the client sending some additional information up. If you find yourself spending a lot of time scrolling through the packet so that you can read this ASCII portion, stop, stop for a moment, right mouse click on one of those packets and choose to follow the stream. You have three options for following streams in Wireshark. You can follow TCP streams, UDP streams, and SSL streams. And whichever stream it is you selected will be darkened and available to you and active in Wireshark's menu. So I'll say that I want to follow the TCP stream. All right, now a window pops up and it shows me exactly what data transpired between the client and the server. The client's data will by default be in red and any data sent by the server will be in, by default in blue and you can change those in your preferences setting if you wish. Here now we can tell exactly what that conversation is. This is an IRC communication. I recognize the user command, nick command, user host, and especially that join command. So at this point we can tell that this client is automatically connecting to an IRC server in the background. Okay, but now what? Okay, so we know that the client's connecting to an IRC server. What is that IRC server telling the client to do? Well, by right mouse clicking and looking at what it said, I couldn't tell what that command string was telling that client to do. But my, what I may want to do is clear out the filter that was applied by following that stream and just looking at what the client does next. We see in this case the client goes out and it does a query for hometown.aol.com, gets a response, tries to make a connection, it is an unsuccessful connection attempt, and then it begins its scanning process. So probably something during that uh, IRC command exchange, something in there told this client, okay, begin your scan process. Whenever I look at scans taking place on a network, I pay attention to whether any numbers are skipped. So here we're just looking at the target systems and the numbering. If some numbers are skipped, then maybe there was some sort of a discovery process that took place ahead of time and it defined which hosts were up on the network. That would be a little smarter than just blind scanning a network. Okay, Laura, so now what? What do I do? I know that this host is infected. How do I know what I'm up against? Well, let me take you out just the same way we did with this customer and I'll show you how we found out what they were up against. You have some signatures. You have port 18067 which is an unusual port. You also have bbjj.househot.com that's a signature and then you also have ypgw.wallone.com. You also have a number of target IP addresses that were given to you in those DNS response packets where you can go out and do some research on those targets. Be careful connecting to those targets just in case those targets will infect other systems in case they're not protected. But these target systems are all ones that I would begin to worry about. So let me take you out. Uh, I'll bring up a browser and let's just find out what this client might be infected with. I am now out at Firefox and I'm simply going to put in a search for bbjj.househot. 
and then maybe ypgw.wallloan. But this seems to tell me enough at this point. I can see that we have a definition of bbjj.househot.com uh, listed as the Windows 32 SD bot worm. So we can see it's also called the mock bot down here, and of course it has all these different names. But this is at least somewhere where we can go to find out what this bot infected host is doing and how can we clean up this bot infected host. So that's what it looks like to analyze bot infected host communications. Pay attention to your DNS communications. Now one last thing I'm going to show you how to do is to use Wireshark and build a filter that will show you when those DNS queries come back and they look a little suspicious. Now I'm back over in the trace file and I'm looking at that second packet where we have the answer resource record, 12 answers coming back. And for me, an answer count that's greater than three, four, maybe five, that makes me really nervous because I see that so constantly in environments where there are bot infected hosts. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a but ugly color filter that will highlight any packets that have an answer resource record value greater than four, let's say. Now when you highlight a field inside of a packet, down below on the status bar, Wireshark will tell you what the name of that field is. It's called dns.count.answers. Now I don't like to type, so I'm going to simply right mouse click and I'm going to prepare a filter based on the selected value. I'm not going to apply it because I don't want to just get values that have 12 answers in them. I don't want DNS uh, responses with 12 answers in them. I want to change the, the filter value. So I'm going to prepare a filter based on the selected value. Now the reason why I'm doing this in my display filter area is because I want to test it first before I create my color filter. So at this point, instead of being equal sign, equal sign 12, I'm going to say that it's greater than and I'm going to put 5 in there. Now I'll go ahead and apply this just to check it out and sure enough there we go we can see that we have a DNS standard query response for the ypgw.wallone.com the CNAME response and we have another one in there that had 11 as the count. Now I know that this works and I'm just going to copy that entire line. Now at this point I'm going to go over to my coloring rules area so I'll select that I'm going to make a brand new coloring rule and I'm going to call this DNS response greater than 5. And in the string area I'm just going to paste in that string that I just created. Now I call this the butt ugly color filter for a reason. I'm going to make this so hideous looking that no matter what trace file I run and no matter how many packets I look at, if a packet comes up and it matches this string, this filter string, it will just scream at me. I can't possibly miss it. So I'm going to select a foreground color of orange because quite frankly there aren't a lot of colors that work really well with orange. So I'll say OK. So now we can see that we have an orange foreground. Now I'm going to choose a background color of green because I know that green and orange look really putrid together. So I'll say OK. Now there is no way I could miss a packet that is colored that way. I'll say OK, but I'm not done yet. It placed my butt ugly color filter at the bottom of the color filter list. There it is down there. But there are other color filters up higher that my packets might hit first. So I want to make sure that this is above any filters that might look for any DNS packets. So we can see in the background that we have this coloring rule string. We've got a coloring rule that somehow changed those packets to a light blue background and a black foreground. Well, that's a coloring rule for UDP. So I want to make sure that I select my butt ugly color filter and I'm going to click up and I'm going to put it way at the top of this list. I want to make sure these really stand out. Now I'll say OK. Now I'll clear my filters and now look at this. There is no way I could miss these butt ugly packets in my trace file. So we've gone through what the symptoms are of a bot infected host. We've gone through reassembly of the communications. We've created our butt ugly color filter to make sure that if we have a bot infected host and we have these strange DNS communications, we won't miss them. Well, I hope you enjoyed looking at the traffic to and from a bot infected host. And I hope you can join us for one of the free Wireshark Jumpstart online classes that we offer 
over at chapelseminars.com.